All right, I want you to pay attention. Ready? You are driving a bus. At the first stop, five people get on the bus. At the next stop, three people get off the bus and two people get on the bus. At the next stop, 10 people get on the bus and six people get off. Okay, are you ready? What is the bus driver's shoe size? If you know the answer, put it in the chat. If you don't know the answer, I'll say this again at the end and you'll get it. Today we're talking about inclusion and action. And what I know is that one of the principles, the, the first principle that we teach in all of our classes is this idea of oneness. And when I talk about oneness, I mean that God or spirit or source is all that there is. There is no space where God is not. And you don't have to use the word God if that's a word that's triggering for you. You can say love, or you can say universe, or you can say quantum field. There is no place where the quantum field is not. It is everywhere present. And in this place, this divine intelligence, the source that all that is, it manifests itself in and through and as all of creation. So there's not like God is there and I'm over here. It's more like God is everywhere and I'm in it. I'm in it. As a matter of fact, not only am I in it, but I'm made up of it. I am an individualized expression of God, of spirit. It loved itself so much that it birthed itself as me and you because it wanted to experience life. Can you imagine if you're already all that is, how are you going to experience yourself? You got you to have some sort of way to see yourself within yourself. And that's what all of us are. So in this oneness, that is all that is, it shows up individualized in diversity. And when I recognize the oneness, then I'm automatically inclusive because I see that what is out there is all a part of me. The body of God, the body of spirit is not a separate body. I am a part of that body. I'm an organ. I might be the liver or the heart and you might be the kidney or the lungs. And everything is essential and needed as the body of the infinite one. So how do I go from there into being the action of inclusivity? When I recognize that other people who are different than me are all a part of spirit, then I can automatically tune into the idea that their point of view is important. Not only important, but a part of my revelation to, of, of evolution of consciousness, right? So three things can help us step into evolving life or society or this, this idea of um, maybe the United States as a newly emerged version of the infinite's highest idea of itself coming through. And the way that we can do that is through three things. One is active listening. The other is through conscious communication. And the third thing is by becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's what can put and make the idea of oneness create inclusion are those three practices. So I'm going to invite you to do those three things this week. Now, I don't know about you, but this whole pandemic thing that we have been, at least here at our center uh, in Seattle, we've been uh, virtual since mid-March. And uh, we thought it was going to be, you know, like a couple months thing, but this is probably looking to be more like going through the end of the year type of thing. And I don't know about you, but doing things virtually is different than I've done them before. Uh, I 
it's, it's not the same thing to teach a class whenever I'm teaching it to people online as it is uh, doing it in person and having this entirely beautiful, great, fabulous room filled with only a handful of people is much different for me than have, having hundreds of people. And so you're all out there, the hundreds of people, you're still there. Thank you for still being there. <laughs> I'm grateful for you. But the energy exchange is different. And so for, for me, I, it's a little uncomfortable. It's, it's a little uncomfortable. And not only that, but there are so many people around this country who are in the midst of, of a big up, upheaval, I'll say. So, you know, thousands of people, have, well, millions of people having the coronavirus, having COVID-19. And, and how many people does that not only affect, but all of their families? And then, uh, the, ever since George Floyd's death, there's been the constant protests and the realization of the depth of racism in our country that's been happening. And so, so, and, and there's, so there's this kind of churning that's happening everywhere. There's, um, there's, there's, elections are coming up. So there's the Democrats and the Republicans and the Libertarians and the Green Party and everybody has their own point of view and their own perspective and, and things seem kind of divisive right now. But I wanna invite you into the possibility of going beyond that divisiveness and stepping into the world of oneness and inclusion, which means that we all have a part to play, all of us, myself included. I have a part to play in this. And, you know, Harriet, Harriet um, excuse me, not Harriet, Howard Thurman said, you can't stand in the midst of the world and struggle for fundamental change unless you are standing in your own space and looking for change within. So this is my invitation to you this week, is to use these three spiritual practices. Listening, active listening. Did you know that pretty much 70 to 80% of our day is engaged in communication in some sort? So that's 9% of it is typically, this is a, various studies have shown this. 9% uh, of us are engaged, in, or not 9%, 9% of our day we're engaged in writing. 16% of our day we're engaged in reading. 30% we're engaged in speaking. And 45% in listening. And yet, studies confirm that most of us are poor and inefficient listeners. Research suggests that re we remember less than 50% of what we hear in a conversation. Less than 50%. Now, I thought, you know, I'm a good listener. I'm a minister. I'm, you know, I'm taught how to listen to people. That's what I do, right? And so then I'm on a walk with my wife the other day, yesterday, actually, and we're, I was kind of curious because we have a, a, oh, an RV, and our RV is a class B, and I don't understand why our RV is a class B instead of like a class C. There's like an A, B, and C, and so my wife does some research, and we're on our walk, and she's telling me why, um, what, what the thought pattern is behind the naming convention for the RVs. So I get the, the thought pattern behind um, class A, but then when it gets to class B, which I'm really interested in, she's telling me, and while she's telling me, I start thinking about my sermon. Like, what am I going to speak about? I haven't finished, I haven't completed my sermon, and we're walking along. And then she goes into class C, and I'm tuned back into her. And then all of a sudden, I realize that I hadn't been listening to her, so I don't even know what the answer was for the class B. So I say, Hey, could you tell me that again? Because I wasn't paying attention to that. Which fortunately, my wife is very understanding. She didn't get too mad. Uh, and she just told me what, what the explanation was. But it 
dawned on me that I'm giving a talk about listening, and there I am, not even listening to my wife. I, I caught, what, 50% of what she said? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm doing the exact thing that I'm talking about. So I make a commitment to be more engaged, to be an active listener. And there's, uh, there's different types of listening. For instance, there's competitive listening, right? So this is where somebody is speaking or making an argument, and, and then the listener who's over here, as soon as they start talking, they're like, okay, this is what I'm gonna respond with, and I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna say that, and, I'm gonna, and as soon as that person's finished, or maybe not even before they're finished, they like jump in and they say, well, this and this and this and this, and the other person, da, 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 and this is that, you know, and so then there's like a competition, who's gonna speak first, who's gonna speak loudest, who's gonna do this? And maybe that's the type of listener that you are. I wanna encourage you to do something different to start changing and shifting how you listen to people. So you also may be engaging in this idea of passive listening. And this is where somebody's speaking at a captive audience. For instance, like me right now, I'm speaking at you. You are so captive on your TV at home. Hi, that's me. I am doing, um, you're engaging in passive listening. However, I would love it if you engaged online in the chat by reflecting some active listening. So let me tell you about the active listening. This is where the listeners engage in a conversation in, in speaking and being curious. Now, unfortunately, because I'm speaking and I can't see your comments, uh, it's not as active as I'd like it to be. But you can still work with me here and reflect things back if you want to. I'll go back in the chat and read what you reflected back. But this is where you reflect the message that you hear, you, rephrasing it and using your own words to make sure you heard it correctly. This is a way that you engage yourself in the discussion. You're not trying to impose your point of view. You're trying to actually receive the point of view of the other person. So this is called tactical listening. It's active listening. And you can do this, this the, the tactics of this are by three things. Number one, reception. Number two is comprehension. Number three is reflection. So, reception. The way to do this is by stopping talking yourself. Re you're receiving, right? You're listening, you're receiving. You create an environment so that you can focus on the speaker specifically. And if you are in a place where you're in physicality with the person or you're on Zoom where you can see the person, you can mirror what you're seeing with them. So I, you know, I could do this, then the other person does this, they listen in. It's a great technique is mirroring. The second thing is comprehension. This is where you reflect your understanding of what the speaker is saying by making notes of key words and concepts of what the speaker says. And you might delicately interrupt the speaker to ask questions just to clarify the, what they said if you don't understand it or the meaning so, so you can really get what they are saying. So you're really comprehending what the speaker said. And the third thing is reflection. You can reflect or paraphrase what you hear on three levels. You can do it by data or statistics. You can reflect back uh, belief systems or you can reflect feelings. So does anybody remember what the data was that I said at the beginning of this? Or were you only listening 50% of the time? I'll, I'll let you know again. The data is, is that the study on average is that we spend 70 to 80% of our waking time in some form of communication. 9% is writing, 16% is reading, 30% is speaking, and 45% is listening. And of that 45% of the time, research suggests that we remember less than 50% of what we hear in a conversation. Can you imagine? I mean, we're talking all the time. 
when only 50% is getting through. So in order to really understand, to show somebody that you're listening, you can paraphrase the facts, you can dig more deeply into the point of view by conveying the beliefs and the feelings that the speaker has to say. So you can be clear about their worldview. And you can echo the feelings that you hear this speaker speaking. So that's one, that's one, that's one technique that's called active listening. So I, I'm going to challenge you this week to, to engage in a conversation that is about active listening and see what it's like to really hear somebody and see what it's like when that person actually is heard. I do this in my classes a lot, and the, the feedback is phenomenal. I mean, people love to be heard. Wouldn't you like to give that gift to somebody else? So the second spiritual technique is conscious communication. Now, conscious communication is about having information, intuition, and insights flow easily and effortlessly from one person to the other. There's, there's a dynamic re reciprocity that happens between me and the person who's having this conversation. But the, 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 the idea is to get to where we're having conscious conversation and communication around difficult subjects. So can we engage in conscious communication when we have challenging things happen in our lives? Can we get to the place of an efficient resolution of misunderstandings? Now, there's a lot of people that are working right now on, on uh, dismantling racism, on dismantling sexism, on dismantling um, all, the, all the isms that are going on in the world. There's a conscious movement that's happening. And the movement is, is happening because people are engaging in education, people are engaging in dialogue, and people are, are engaging in actual acts of systemic change. They're creating new ways of being and they're, they're taking action. And the, the, the opportunity here with all of this that's rising up within our communities and in our country is that we need to do this consciously. We need to do this having an intention and a, a conscious communication around it. Now, one thing to keep in mind is with COVID uh, and millions of people having it and lots of people dying and then, oh, all of the other health things that are going on in people's lives besides that because there's other things going on as well. And then there is this, this conversation around um, racism, and then there's the election, right? So there's all of these uh, differing points of view that are coming on that cause um, challenging conversations to happen. There's also what, what I'm, I'm realizing is, like my friends of, of color have, have given me some great insight about, um, a couple of them have told me, it's, it's more like what they're going through uh, one of my friends said, she said, it's kind of like, you know, there's a, you break a bone in your body, and let's say the bone sets off, and then it heals, and then you go to the doctor, and the doctor's like, okay, well, in order to get this to heal correctly, we need to break it again. And so you have to break the bone again and go through that pain in order for it to heal correctly. And another one of my friends said that she's kind of like, uh, you know, like if you get a cut on your leg, but then it doesn't, it starts getting infected, but then it heals over and there's an infection underneath. And then in order to get the infection out, I know this is gross also, you gotta like rip it open, clean it out, and then the, the true healing can happen. It's kind of like, that's what's happening in our country right now. Like the bone is being reset, the wound is reopened, the cleaning is happening, and it's super painful. And it's really painful for people who are being directly affected. So, so not just in regarding racism or, or other experiences, it's also regarding 
all the people who have COVID-19 and, pe- and all their families. So think of it this way. I really want to have you think about the circle of grief or, or ring theory. So this is, I mean, this is really trying to figure out, like, how do I balance my emotions and my reactions to a tragedy that happened while acknowledging the greater burden carried by those immediately involved? And so this is what I would do just in thinking about that. So imagine the circle of grief. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to draw a small circle right here, right? And put the name of the person closest to the tragedy in the middle of the circle. And then you're going to draw a larger circle around that circle. And you're going to put the name of the people closest to that center person, uh, perhaps a spouse, maybe children. So the people closest to that center person. Um, And then you're going to draw another circle, and this is like close friends and uh, maybe uh, grandparents or or colleagues that are really intimate with that person. Then you're going to draw another circle, and these are are these these are like closer or these are kind of more distant friends, right? on the outer circle, and then you might draw a bigger circle, and that's like members of the community, and then there's uh, a bigger circle, and that's like, you know, acquaintances. So we have these kind of concentric circles going on. So here's the rules. The person in the center circle can cope any way he or she wants. The job of those in in the larger circles is to listen and support. When talking into a circle smaller than yours, remember that you're talking to somebody closer to the tragedy. Your job is to help. You are not allowed to dump your anger, fear, or grief on people in the circle smaller than yours. Express these emotions in those in your circles or in the larger circles outside. So here's the concept. Comfort in, dump out. Comfort in, dump out. That's the concept. Rumi said, listen with ears of tolerance. See through the eyes of compassion. Speak with the language of love. So here we are, and I want to engage in a conversation that might be a challenging conversation. People might be uh, trying to finish their wills, or they might be talking about this conversation of, um, I have elderly parents, and we can't see them in the nursing home, um, and we, we want to create ways that we can communicate them, or uh, my, my spouse is deteriorating, or my person has, my, my closest friend has COVID-19, or my best friend is experiencing racism, or I just realized that I've been expressing racism. So all of these things are going on, and the opportunity is to have dialogue around them and not ignore what's going on. This is the biggest opportunity we have, and that's by having courageous conversations. So the way to do this, to have courageous conversations that are conscious, is to speak when you're grounded. So here's what you're going to do to speak when you're grounded. You're going to ground your feet. And you're going to imagine that there's roots growing down through your feet. And then you're going to draw the energy of the earth from the earth up into your body. And it's best to do this before you have the conversation as you are breathing. So breathe it in, have that energy come up. And breathe it out and have these roots grow deep into the earth. And then breathe it in. And breathe the roots down into the earth. And one more time. And then breathe it down. (sighs) Start your conversation grounded. When I react to somebody else, I initiate conflict. But when I speak from that grounded point of view, I create a, a safety container that allows the other person to be heard. The second thing is to speak slowly. So when you're going to engage in these conversations, speak slowly. Allow yourself to pace 
and give yourself some space between the words. The third thing is to use brevity. Speak your point and let it be done. And the fourth thing in that is to pause. I'm doing, uh, I just completed a mean white supremacy book study with a bunch of ministers online from Centers for Spiritual Living. And we used that, <clears throat> that technique as an opportunity to, to have um, dialogue with each other. So I would speak and then we would all breathe. So I invite you, if you're engaging in conversations that are challenging or difficult, it put, put this as a proposal for your family or your friends on how to engage together in these conversations. Speak grounded, speak slowly, speak briefly, and pause in between. And that will help change our world as we'll be able to hear each other better and easier. So the third thing that I'm going to encourage you to do is by being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but I've been pretty uncomfortable recently. Like, there's just a lot going on, and it has been really uncomfortable. The conversations I've had are really uncomfortable. The awakenings that I've had are really uncomfortable. But I have to say... Have you ever grown and not been uncomfortable? Like, have you ever had something in your life that was like a, a radical growth experience that wasn't uncomfortable? I don't know about you, but everything that has been amazing growth in my life has been incredibly uncomfortable. You know, I think back to, you know, just starting in this teaching and, and, and making all these amazing declarations, you know. Um, one of my declarations was, I want radical transformation in my life. I am radically transformed by this teaching and this belief system. Don't ever do that, by the way. Don't. <laughs> Uh, because my life was radically transformed. It completely fell apart. I was in a, uh, going to be married, and it just dissolved. The whole relationship dissolved. Um, everything that I had known in my life just kind of melted away. I uh, lost my job. I, you know, it's like I lost, I, I, did, I did the whole, um, you know, losing, losing all of these things, and everything was falling apart. But they fell apart so it could fall together. And I had wanted radical transformation, which is what I got. And I, I'm actually grateful for the tra radical transformation. Um, but I, I'd like it in a less condensed form. But right now, what do you think we're going through? I mean, what, what is this? This is, this is radical transformation. We're being, we're being skyrocketed into a new paradigm. And we can't not be in the new paradigm because of COVID-19 and because of our dreams and desires that we want to have emerge. And the only way for them to emerge is through being uncomfortable. So what's going on right now is an amazing growth experience for all of us. That's what's going on. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So where do you stand now? I watched a video by Love, Lovey Ajayi, and she's a black woman who's from Nigeria, moved to the United States. And she has a TED Talk about being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I encourage you to watch it. But she talks about being a domino. Can we be the domino? And she says, for a line of dominoes to fall, one of them has to fall first to hit the other one. And it leaves the others choiceless but to do the same. And when that domino falls, we're 
we're hoping that the next person that sees this is inspired to be the domino in that chain reaction. And she says being the domino looks like speaking up and doing things that are really difficult, especially when they're needed, with the hope that others will follow suit. That's what Ty Tyrone Burke did in the Me Too movement. She stood up and said what had happened to her in her own life and, and um, of being, uh, uh, of the sexual abuse that she had received. And she started this, this Me Too movement. Now, it didn't take off as a movement until 12 years later when more and more women decided to say, Me Too, this has happened to me. And they spoke out publicly. And I decided to organize one of my women's retreats around the Me Too movement when it was happening. And uh, I, I kind of interviewed all the women on my team and we had these conversations about the movement and about our own experiences. And come to find out that 90% of the women I had communication with and had been at my retreat had experienced this, had experienced some form of sexual abuse or um, being, being overtaken by a, a man. And it was really powerful. Like I had thought, you know, all the studies that said, oh, one in three women had been raped and one in, you know, so, so many women had been uh, sexually abused. And I'm not saying that men haven't, by the way. I know a lot of men who have as well. Um, but, I'm, but in this movement, it was like so many women had not spoken up for years and years or had spoken up and never been heard. And so now, collectively, the women spoke up publicly. And I, I was one of them. Like, me too. Happened to me too. And we had these conversations and realized, like, we're done with that. We're done with it. But it took a collective group of people standing up and courageously saying publicly that this happened to me. And it's got to stop. And so Lovey Ajayi had this, had a very good example of how she's been speaking up recently. So she published a book like five years ago. And, um, and then she got invited to speak at a bunch of conventions all around the world. And she was asked to speak at a conference, and she said she was asked to pay her way there. So she happened to be networked with a whole bunch of other people, you know, conference speakers. And she asked them, oh, has anybody spoken at this conference? And did you have to pay or, um, you know, were you paid? And she got a whole bunch of responses back. And she found out that the men who, the white men who were, who were asked to speak at the conference, they had their ways, uh, they had their entire trip paid for, and they got a stipend. The white women got their trip paid for, but they didn't get a stipend. And she, as a black woman, did not get her way paid and did not get a stipend. She actually had to pay to go to the conference. And inside of her, she was wondering, like, should I bring this up like it's an honor? These are the things that happen this, in, in, in one's head, right? It's such an honor to be asked to speak at a conference, but this doesn't seem right, but it's happening right now. And if I speak up publicly, are people going to leave me because they're going to be afraid that I'm going to speak, speak up against them? And so she decided to go ahead and speak up and bring this issue to light about this conference. And she um, talked to a reporter at Forbes, and they just kind of revealed this story, and it went viral. And it was very courageous, but also very scary of her, because she could lose her whole livelihood by speaking up and saying that this was wrong. But what happened is that other people said, this has been happening to me too. Oh, this has been happening to me too. This has happened to me too. And there was an awareness that happened that shifted the policy in that conference. Some people left the conference, but some people realized that they can't behave like that anymore. So collectively, it is up to us to stand into the opportunity of making a difference in this world by saying, this is enough. I'm not going to deal with this anymore and bringing things to light. I admire 
lovey. I admire her. She's one of my new heroes. And I continue to have new heroes in my life that are popping up everywhere who in this day and age, in this time period, and what we're involved with, with are willing to take a stand for love. Now, taking a stand for love is like, I love myself so much that I know I deserve this. Or I love this person so much that I know they deserve that as well. That's taking a stand for love. And saying that this is done, like I'm done with this. This discrimination, this racism, these things that are happening, I'm done with it because I stand for love, because I'm a part of the wholeness, of the oneness of the human body. And that organ, that person over there who is a part of my body, who looks so different than me, is a part of me too. And we deserve to operate in a healthy, vibrant manner together. Eckhart Tolle said, the fire of suffering becomes the light of consciousness. Driven by greed and ignorant of their connectedness to the whole, humans persist in behavior that, if continued unchecked, can only result in their own destruction. He says, you do not become good by trying to be good, but by finding goodness that is already within you, by allowing that goodness to emerge. And Howard Thurman says, and this is important to remember, given the fact of pain as a normal part of the experience of life, one may make the pain contribute to the soul, to the life meaning. One may be embittered and ground down by it, but one need not be. The pain of life may teach us to understand life and by our understanding of life, to love life. To love life truly is to be whole in all of one's parts. And to be whole in all of one's parts is to be free and unafraid. So my invitation to you, are you willing to actually listen to others? I encourage you to engage in active listening as a practice. Would you be willing to engage in conscious communications by having courageous conversations with others that might be different from you? By willing to listen to them, staying grounded, and having an actual conversation that brings about dialogue and understanding as a purpose? Would you be willing to become even more comfortable with being uncomfortable because we're in a space of growth for this country and for this community and for this world? Would you be willing to allow inclusion to be a part of your life by being uncomfortable and getting comfortable with that? I encourage you to be receptive to the change that's happening right now. We cannot stop it. It's a part of who we are. And the only way to change what's going on out there is to change what's going on in here. Because if it's, it's, if it's my choice, then I choose to be a part of the change to make this happen in the world. I choose to be the change that I wish to see in the world. And I choose to be that today, right here and right now. And so it is. Let's pray. Oh. What a time to be alive. What a time to be in the space of the infinite presence of life that is causing itself to step into a new way of being, step into this global realization of our interconnectedness, step into this realization that something is emerging and that even sometimes when a bone has to be rebroken in order to get back into its original form, the pain is worth it. And so I know and claim that the pain that is emerging in this time is really a pain of bringing all that is no longer serving us to the light 
and stepping into a new realm of possibility, dismantling those belief systems and those ways of being that no longer serve us and stepping into a new way of seeing, a new way of feeling, a new way of revealing wholeness on this planet. And so I commit to be a place where God shows up. I commit to be a place where the infinite spirit charges through me, where I can see the beauty and the love all around me in its diversity, in the way that it shows up. And I can start creating a world that works for everyone. Even if that means that I got to change who I am because I know that this change is for the better. And so as I settle into that, I just let it all go. I let it all go. I let all the past go. I let all the hurt go. I let it all go and I allow myself to just revel in the love that is the new awakening that is happening because of what's going on. And so as I step into that love, I allow it to wrap me like a warm blanket of receptivity, of sweetness, of compassion, allowing me to open to my own heart's calling, which is calling forth a new planet, a planet of kindness, a kindness, a planet of empathy, a planet of love. And I see that now with, with eyes that see a new existence, a new possibility. I welcome it. I am open to it. And I say, yea, God, let it be in and through me and as me right here, right now. This is the time. I claim it. I know it. I declare it. I am it. I express it. And I am the fulfillment of this word right here, right now, as is everybody who is on this screen right now, we are the voice, the body, the expression of love right here, right now. And so it is. Bring it on, everything new, everything different, everything true. I am ready for my next thing to do. Oh, I know it's going to be everything new. I'm through crying. I'm through waiting. I'm through hoping against all hope. I'm through That'll never return. I think I finally learned to bring it on. Everything new, everything different, everything true. I am ready for my next thing to do. Oh, I know it's gonna be. Everything new. I'm through grieving. I'm through dreaming that the life I had is ever coming back. No more wishing on someone else's star that'll never be mine. I think it's finally time to bring. Everything new, everything different, everything true. I am ready for my next thing to do. Oh, I know it's going to be everything new. I've survived many times before, broken. I did back then. 